Dr. Mangal, are you there with us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, good evening, uh, Dr. Mangal, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here this evening with us on Straight Up. Um, and right, uh, and this is uh, Mr. Benchop. Yes, it is, Dr. Pangal, uh, and you are live on the air at the moment. Good evening to you. Good evening. Oh, yes. Uh, for many folks around the world, especially those uh, in Guyana who are listening to you at this point in time, they have been reading a lot of your articles as it pertains to oil. Um, in 2017, you were appointed uh, a petroleum advisor to President David Granger. Uh, that lasted for about a year, but we're going to get into that. All we want to talk about oil, we want to hear about this Exxon Mobil deal, whether it's good for Guyana, whether it's not good for Guyana, what are some of the, uh, the pluses and the minuses and so forth. But before we get into that, Dr. Mangal, people who don't know you, but they've been reading a lot of what you're, uh, a lot of your writings and so forth, who exactly is Dr. Mangal and what part of Guyana are you originally from? Okay, so I am from Georgetown, from Kitty, or an area just uh, on the border of Kitty called Sublionville, which is by the seawall. I went to Stella Maris for my primary school, and then to Saints on Brick Dam for secondary school. And I did about, after four years at Saints, I actually left Guyana. Uh, my father's from Guyana, my mother's from, from Europe, from Denmark. So I uh, moved to, to Europe, but every couple times a year I would be back in Guyana. Every year since I've left, I've been back to Guyana. Um, my professional career, well, my education is civil engineering undergraduate at Edinburgh in Scotland, and then I did a PhD at Oxford University in England in geotechnical engineering, and specifically offshore geotechnical engineering. And my research there my thesis was on, you know, the design of oil platforms. Uh, my professional career has mostly been with Chevron, which is a large oil company, not as big as, as Exxon, a bit smaller than Exxon, but one of the major oil companies. And that's, I was spent seven years in Houston with Chevron, and did like three different jobs with Chevron in Houston, did projects in West Africa, Nigeria, Angola, even though I was based in, in Houston. Then we moved as a family to Vietnam for a project in Vietnam, lived there for a number of years. Then to the Philippines with my family as well, lived there for a number of years with Chevron. And then returned to Houston in 2015. And then I started speaking with President Granger in 2016 and started the farmer role advising him in 2017, in March of 2017, and that lasted for 13 months, ended at the end of March 2018. All right, for those of you who are now joining us, we have on the line with us Dr. Mandel, and I deliberately um, left out his first name because I don't want to call you Jan. How is it really pronounced, um, Doctor? Well, it's Jan. So if it, it would be helpful if we just use my first name in this call. I think it would be easier. And it's pronounced like a Y, Yan, J A. It's J A N, but it's pronounced like Yan. Yes, uh, are, you, are you there? Yep, yeah, I can still hear you. Yes, one. Okay, so get right into business. And uh, again, for those of you who are now joining us, we have on the line Jan. Um, you guys should know him as Dr. Mangal, the oil expert. And he has given you a long list there of his experience in this uh in this arena. This is not just he went and he did a, a one-year course and then he's back or a six-month course and then he's back to say that he's an expert. Do you okay. know what I mean? And um, I'm not talking any uh, um, yeah, is it okay if I call you Mark? Sure, it's okay. Yes. I'm, I'm Mark, I, I prefer not to be called an expert. I'm, I'm more of a professional, of an oil and gas professional. That's how I like, I think is more appropriate to refer to myself. I, I'm not, not really an, an expert. All right, a professional in the oil industry, and I respect that with many years of Chevron. Uh, let's get to the first question. In, in, when you were appointed for that one-year contract to be the advisor to the president of the Cooperative Republic of China, specifically, what was your role? Okay, so first of all, it wasn't 
one contract for one year. The first contract was six months, and then we renewed it for another six months. So it was actually two contracts. So my the role was uh, a quick a sentence to describe it was the president wanted someone to try to ensure that this oil wealth would help the country. So that, that, that's the one sentence. You know, my, my role was to uh, advise on issues to ensure that the wealth actually benefits the country. Because when you look around the world, uh, many places like Guyana find oil and it doesn't help them. It, it actually can make the country worse, the situation worse. So, okay. So, some of the ingredients uh, in my terms of reference are, but one of the top items in my terms of reference for the job advising the president, and also this was paid for by the IDB, which is Inter American Development Bank. So, I was actually kind of had uh, a bit of two bosses at the same time. You know, I was. Uh, advising the president, but the IDB were paying, and I worked with the IDB closely. But so, some of the ingredients were transparency. So transparency was top on the list, you know, releasing the contracts. That was a focus item. And, and then a bunch of uh, other items uh, were in terms of reference. All right. So uh, we have here... Um uh, oil professional, and uh, we're talking about the situation there in Guyana and uh, Exxon Mobil. We know that they have um, they have um, they have been some controversies with regards to two specific blocks, but we're going to get to that uh, shortly. Um, but let us talk in terms of the production sharing agreement and uh, the relationship between Exxon Mobil and uh, Guyana. Uh, what is it in terms of the signing of the contract and all these sort of things? How would you break that down for the layman, um, Jan, with regards to what is there that Guyana will benefit from this whole oil deal? That is what the layman wants and woman wants to hear. Okay. So the way I would sell this thing is that, you know, we look at Guyana since independence and we were pretty disappointed. You know, we know we could have done a lot better. And even though we've had resources, we've had gold, a lot of gold, timber and stuff, we, we just haven't managed to make that help the man in the street. So now is an opportunity with oil, which is hugely valuable, to to go and fix all the things and do all the things we haven't done for 53 years and make sure Guyana becomes the little Switzerland in the Caribbean, the little Singapore on the north of South America. And, but to make this huge transformation, and it is possible, you know, with the oil, it is possible if we get a fair deal with the oil, to make this huge transformation that will help the man in the street. And not only that, it will help our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean because Guyana should be the beacon of the Caribbean, and Guyana could return to being the beacon of the Caribbean, not in terms of giving out oil to people, but in terms of an agricultural base, an intellectual base, a manufacturing base, a business base. Uh, Guyana should be the doorway to South America for our Caribbean you know, brothers and sisters, and for Europe as well. So there, there's a lot of opportunity there for Guyana. But to make this thing work, we need to go and fix all of those impediments that held us back for 53 years. So it's not going to be easy. You know, there's a bunch of things or reasons why Guyana did not succeed over the last 53 years. And if we don't fix those things, Guyana will not succeed moving forward with oil. What are the, what are the two or maybe three top things that you believe that Guyana that needs to be fixed in Guyana almost immediately? So we need people. We need competency. We need capacity and competency, meaning we need people who can do the work in a competent and ethical way. And this is specifically now immediately to do with oil. Uh, these are people who 
know what is good for the country and are willing to fight with companies like Exxon. And when I say fight, you know, this is not an aggressive thing. This is just a negotiation. But uh, you, you, you actually have to uh, be tough to negotiate and get a good deal. Uh, and we don't have those people. We haven't hired those people. We've been reluctant to hire the people. And nothing will get done without the right people. We can't do anything without the right people. And we do not have the right people. So the immediate thing would be to, to get uh, professionals from around the world. And these won't be Guyanese. Very few will be Guyanese. And we need to be very careful about the, about the people we hire. We need to make sure they have ethical backgrounds. Because this oil industry is high stakes. People who you hire, if they're open to taking bribes and stuff in the back, they, they will do it because there's a lot of money floating around. So we need to ensure we have competent and ethical people, but we need those people ASAP. As an advisor, as an advisor, uh, now a former advisor to the president, uh, President Granger, have you outlined these immediate uh, actions that ought to be taken to him? Yes, if you recall from the interview on TV from the day I was hired, I think it was broadcast on TV locally in March 2017, I spoke about the need for this core team, this uh, team of five or whatever. I, I was just supposed to be a start. And however, the money wasn't available. You know, we uh, money is needed to hire expats. And we were hoping that some of the ministries would take a lead as well in staffing up. Well, unfortunately, most of them didn't. So that's why we decided we needed the new Department of Energy, because we didn't really see any progress in the ministries. So the president took the decision to set up the new Department of Energy so as to have a home to start putting uh, these oil and gas professionals in. With your experience um, over the years in, in this particular area, and being an advisor to the president, uh, two, six months since you have done, uh, the perception is there might have been something as to why such an experienced individual walked away from that contract. Can you explain what happened and why you were no longer there? So I wouldn't describe it as, as walk in a way. Um, when my second six-term contract came to an end, the president and I did discuss next steps. And we both agreed uh, because, you know, I knew for, for certain that we needed people full-time on the ground in Guyana. I was not available full-time in March of 2017. I... In the, because you know, I wrote the proposal for the new Department of Energy. I actually described the roles of the people needed to be hired, and they all needed to be full time. I was not available full time then. I did. Uh, we did discuss about me working, say, three weeks a month in Guyana as a possibility at a later stage, or even moving to Guyana in the summer of 2019, uh, based on my you know family circumstance. I, I there was an opening possibility of me moving to Guyana with my family in summer of 2019, so right now. But the, in the interim, the president hired uh, some folks in to head up the new department. And the president is a very busy, busy person. He can't micromanage this oil and gas stuff. So he is, you know, given the folks in the new department of energy the responsibility, and I have spoken with them. I spoke with them last September, but it's clear that they are not that comfortable with uh, with myself, uh, they with my outspokenness, and with the work I've been doing, advocacy work I've been doing for Guyana. So you know, I'm if the opportunity arises, I'm happy to come back and work for Guyana, but directly for the government. But what I'm doing now on my own, I am working for Guyana. I, I am pushing a Guyana, pro-Guyana agenda. And I find it's actually more effective, in ways more effective than if I was inside and working directly for government. 
So this this for you is not about the money. It's about looking for a good deal and betterment for all Guyanese. Yes, when you know when I finished with the president in March 2018 last year, I knew I could get a top job. I'm I'm probably one of the Guyanese with the most uh, oil and gas experience with a major with a major oil company. I have a lot of Guyanese with the smaller companies or with service companies, but you know. In my last role at Chevron, I was responsible for a budget of 500 million, half a billion dollars. So I had that experience. And then I was the advisor to the president for a year. So I knew when I finished with the president, I could go and get a top job in industry. But when I looked around Guyana, I asked myself, who is batting for Guyana? Who, who, is, who is pushing the Guyana agenda? And I saw no one. And after advising the president and seeing how government functions and somehow how the ministers function, I realized Guyana is on a bad way. And looking at what the opposition did, I realized Guyana is in a very bad and risky way. So I decided to give myself a year to write and try and do advocacy work unpaid for Guyana. And now that year has come to an end and I need to decide what to do and I can't continue doing this forever because I need to, you know, get a paying job. But at that point, I, uh, it was clear that no one was really pushing strongly, aggressively for a pro Guyana agenda. All right, if you're now joining us, my name is Mark Benjot. You're listening to my guest, uh, Dr. Jan Mandel, is lots of experience in the, in the area of oil. Uh, and it's something that it's uh, topical. We discuss it every every day, every minute of the day, because Guyanese want to know what exactly is in it for them, for the entire country. And that's a reasonable question. That's a reasonable concern. Dr. Vangal is walking us through the process. One of the things, doctor, or you prefer that I call you Jan, it's okay. Um, this, we have been hearing for months now about the signing bonus. It's ticklish. 18 million U.S. dollars seems to be a crumbs, crumbs compared to, let's say, what Brazil got for their signing bonus, which is almost a billion U.S. dollars. How do you explain that we were able to sign that contract with ExxonMobil for, for 18 million U.S.? Yes, it, that's uh, ridiculous because Guyana could have gotten a lot more. Uh, I believe that contract was signed in 2016. You know, when you see the document which has been released, it says the summer sometime in 2016. Uh, I was not aware that they had a signed contract, even though I was advising the president, until I started advising the president in 2017. So sometime in March or April 2017, I realized that, oh, some people have already signed a contract with Exxon. I knew they were talking about it. I, I didn't know. I didn't realize until after like six months, eight months after they signed it that it was actually signed, and the president seemed surprised as well. So, wait, wait, wait a minute, doctor. Wait a minute. You're saying then that a contract, a signing bonus, was was actually the signature was already sealed with Exxon Mobil. The president was unaware. You, as an advisor to the president, was also unaware of that signing of the contract, the eighteen million dollars. Yes, and it's not really the, the eighteen million is just a part of the contract. But this whole production share and agreement, which was signed in twenty sixteen, I did not become aware of it until twenty seventeen when I was advising the president, and there was some surprise as well. Uh, in the Ministry of the Presidency with the people I w was working with. So that, that's, that's why I, you know, I believe there's strong, very strong grounds to go and renegotiate this contract. Uh, I believe those who, the ministers who were responsible, uh, did not go about it with consensus. Now, now they may say, yes, they had consensus, but at the time, I don't believe there was consensus within cabinet or a wider consensus. And I su suspect that these ministers kind of acted on a rogue basis. And 
the excuse they use is Venezuela. So whenever you challenge the $18 million contract, the excuse is always, oh, well, we, we, we have to protect Ghana from Venezuela. Well, that is absolute nonsense. Uh, they could have gotten what they wanted and what Ghana deserved, and still Exxon and the U.S. would protect Ghana against Venezuela. You know, Exxon is not going to leave Ghana. Even if we had a much larger sign-in bonus, even if we have 10% royalty, and even if Exxon is paying tax, Exxon would still be making a lot of money, and they will stay in Guyana. Unfortunately, Exxon thinks it's Christmas every day in Guyana now because they just get, they can't believe what they're getting. So for Exxon and Hess and all these other companies, they think, well, Guyana is like Santa Claus. So uh, it, it just keeps flowing for them. They, they can't believe it. And we, we are not even approaching them or challenging them to get a fair deal. But is the president comfortable with this in, in terms of assuming that there hasn't been approached in terms of uh, it, um, an approach to Exxon to say, hey, we have to get back on the table here. Yeah. Is, the, is the president comfortable at all with this deal? I don't believe he is. You know, I, I can't uh, speak for the president, but my interpretation is the president is not comfortable. My assessment is the president wants a better deal for Guyana. And my assessment is that the president is quite upset about uh, the deal that his ministers did. And, but it will be tough to get uh, a better deal, but we have to do it. We indeed have to get a better deal. If you're now joining us, it's 34 minutes after 8 o'clock. My name is Mark Benchkap. On the line, we have Jan Mongo uh, talking about the oil situation there in Guyana and the sort of deals that we should have gotten that we didn't get, and it's not too late for us to get it. But Jan, let us touch on, um, would it be costly to um, basically rene renegotiate now with Exxon? So Exxon would like to let, make us believe it would be. So. If, if you recall what people were saying in 2017, 2018, like when I just went to UG, University of Guyana, and I said, you know, Guyana should probably get a better deal. It's not a good deal. There was such a backlash. It, it was like, how could you even talk about that? There was such a taboo about it. Because that is Exxon's strategy. Exxon wants countries like Guyana to, to feel that, oh, if you even come and try to get a good deal, that's the end of the world. Well, no, it's not. These things are renegotiated all the time. These contracts between governments and companies are renegotiated all the time. And a lot of the time, it's the companies who come running to the government saying, oh, can we please renegotiate? So uh, what happened in Guyana is, you know, we have people who are responsible who don't have the experience, they're not competent, and they in, in the sector and in the, in the negotiations, and they try to do it all themselves. And they also felt that first aisle before the next election would help them win the next election. So, but that's not the case. First aisle before the next election will not help anyone, any party win the next election. Uh, so they they became rushed. And once you are in a rush as a government, you can't negotiate. Then the oil company kind of has you over the barrel. Uh, to, for Ghana to negotiate well, it needs to take its time. It needs to slow down. It needs to tell Exxon, no, we don't need to approve this now. We want to get a good deal. When we get a good deal, we'll approve it. But that's not how things have happened in Guyana. Well, let's, let's, let's go back to uh, prior to 2015, because ExxonMobil didn't pop up on the scene after 2015. What sort of deal was signed by the prior administration? Because we know what, what the prior administration did just weeks prior to the 2015 elections by giving away two oil blocks, the uh, Kaicho and the Kanji blocks, um, unknown um, persons behind those blocks. Uh, 
What was this deal, ExxonMobil deal, with the previous administration? So, well, there's the Starbuck deal from 1999, but uh, and that was the previous administration a long time ago. But there, there were these two other blocks just before that were awarded just before the election in 2015 by the PPP. Now, I am convinced that those two awards are clearly fraudulent and corrupt and defrauded Guyana of hundreds of millions and possibly even a billion or more US dollars. And uh, why, why do I believe that? Well, the first thing, you don't go and award a deep water oil block to the guy who lives down the street who never pumped a barrel of oil in his life, who only owns a bicycle, he let alone a rig. But that's what the government did. That's what Robert Passad did. Now, they, JHI and Mid-Atlantic, who are some of these companies on ratio, what they're running around saying now is, oh, no, no, well, in March of 2015, we signed a contract, so, you know, it was like a couple of weeks before the election, so we were okay. Well, that is nonsense. These guys were planning this thing for years because Exxon didn't turn up overnight in 2015 and start drilling that well. Exxon was planning this thing for years, and the government knew about it, the government at the time, because they would be notified by Exxon. Exxon would say years in advance, yep, we're coming to Ghana to drill a well, we're going to do some exploration. So once the guys in government heard that, they would run around with their buddies and try to uh, get their buddies these blocks, the Kanji and the Kaichor, because they know that if Exxon is successful in the Starbuck block, these adjacent blocks would become hugely valuable. So if they go and give these blocks out for free to their friends, then if Exxon is successful in the Starbuck block, these guys will all become uh, hugely rich by stealing from the people of Guyana. But in terms of Exxon, I mean, are there international laws that prohibits them from entering into any such deal unless they know who these, uh, who the stakeholders are, the shareholders are, et cetera, et cetera? You would think so, but, and they should be. And Exxon knows exactly what's going on because they buy into these little companies that have no right, no justification for having these blocks. But Exxon and Hess, and then there's this recent news about BP in Africa doing the same. So you would think that the FCPA laws in the U.S. and similar laws around the world would stop these companies from doing it. Well, they don't. And that is because the U.S. and the U.K. and a lot of these other countries turn a blind eye. They, they want their companies, their national companies, to go and get these blocks. So, you know, these countries are not uh, blameless. These countries are not, uh, you know, uh, pushing for rule of law and transparency and everything. They allow their companies to get away with this nonsense. So Exxon knew exactly what Mid-Atlantic and Ratio were up to and how it is so unjustified for these two little companies to have the Kanji and Kaichu block. But he, still, Exxon goes and buys in and takes them over. So, because this is what they do around the world, they do it over and over and over again. And in Guyana, we need to stop that. We, we can't let this continue. So, if we, if we were to find out that these two companies that was awarded, that were awarded uh, um, the two blocks, awarded just mere weeks prior to the 2015 elections by then President. Um, Donald Ramatar, that there are conflict of interest, or there is conflict of interest, sorry, where a sitting minister is part of a shareholder of these two companies, or maybe the president then, and maybe his friends. Well, we, we don't actually need that evidence. All we need to know is that these little companies do not have the capacity as contractors to fulfill their obligation as contractors. So when the government of Guyana awards these blocks, it's like you hiring someone to build your house. So, you know, it's, it's like hiring a contractor. 
So these contractors have to have the capability to do the work. So, you know, when you award a block to Exxon, you know, they, they have very good reputation, you know, for doing work around the world. They got a lot of assets, a lot of people. So you, that's fine. But you can't go hiring a guy down the road pretending that he can do what Exxon does. So we don't need to go and look for Robert Passad or Ramatar having some agreement with Mid Atlantic or Ratio. I'm sure there there's probably some backdoor stuff going on, but we don't need that. All we need to know is that these little companies do not have the, the track record pumping oil in deep water, and that these little companies do not have the hundreds of millions and billions of dollars of assets, and that they've had these assets for a long time. And we know that already. So we just need to rescind the blocks. Well, we've seen the blocks. It seems as though most Guyanese are looking in that direction for that. We've seen some flip flopping by uh, then President Donald Ramatar on the issue. Robert Passad is not as vociferous as he's normally uh, on this, and uh, we can just smell what's happening yeah. right there. And, and the opportunity yeah. here for Guyana is huge. You know, we have these two blocks uh, right next to Starbrook, Kai, Shore and Kanji. We need to take them back. You know, it's not about prosecuting people or uh, the people involved, we just tell, uh, not make the contracts null and void, take these blocks back to the state, then we break the blocks up even more. So we break up Kaichur into a number of smaller blocks, we break up Kanji into smaller blocks, and we start auctioning them off in a proper, transparent way. And Diana will get billions of US dollars now by doing that. And what we need to do is ban Exxon and ban Hess and ban Mid Atlantic and GHI and Ratio from taking part in anything to do with these blocks for the next 10 years. And that will be sufficient punishment for them. Sounds interesting. Punishment in the 2020, Lisa, uh, what is it, uh, phase one is expected to develop a total of 120,000 barrels of oil per day. 120,000 barrels per oil, um, ba barrels per, I mean, barrels of oil per day. That's not, that's not a small amount with your experience at Chevron and so forth. Uh, how do you explain, uh, what percentage is going to remain? Yeah. Profit is good in there in Guyana. So Guyana, we're a small country. You know, that 120,000 barrels per day from Liza One, if that's all we get, that's, that's a lot. If we manage that well, meaning we get a fair deal, we get better terms with Exxon, and if we don't go and waste the money we get, that is a huge impact for Guyana. We can transform Guyana on that. But, you have all of these people running around saying, no, Guyana needs to get 500,000 barrels a day. Guyana needs to get 750,000 barrels per day. No, Guyana only needs a couple hundred thousand barrels per day. Uh, and, and if we manage it well, that will be, that, that will transform Guyana for our children and grandchildren. But our companies don't want that. The businessmen don't want that. They just want Diana to pump and pump everything out as fast as possible because they are making a percentage. So they want Diana to pump all of its oil as quickly as possible so they can get filthy rich. But that's not going to help Diana. Diana is better off pumping less, slower, and making sure we get more of the money. Indeed, making sure we get more. We're looking at the time, 47 minutes after 8 o'clock. My name is Mark Benchap. Uh, Dr. Jan Mango is on the line with us talking about oil. And, um, and I'll, you know, we've heard members of the government talk about um, $5,000 uh, every month, every single uh, individual household that is in Guyana. 5,000. <laughs> I've heard the politicians arguing in favor, some against it. What is your take on that? Is that beneficial? No, it's not, and it's dangerous. And the money just, first of all, the money's not there for that. It just doesn't, there's not enough money for that. Then, secondly, we, we need to give money directly to the poorest and most needy in Guyana. 
but that's just a small percentage. That's not the whole country. You know, we, we need to have direct disbursements to the most vulnerable and needy. But to say you're going to give direct disbursements to the whole country, what you're actually doing is harming Guyana. Because when you do that, what, what will Guyana say? They'll say, oh, yeah, I get a little peace. I'm happy. I don't need to go and push the government to push Exxon to get 10% royalty. I'm happy we're getting crumbs. I'm happy Exxon is just throwing peanuts and crumbs at us because I'm getting a $500 a year. Uh, so what you're doing in effect by giving that money to everyone in Guyana, you're bribing them. You're bribing them, and that will hurt Guyana, and it will benefit Exxon. Wow, interesting indeed. Um, you know, the other thing you spoke earlier about, uh, about the sweetheart deals. Every day we read about the sweetheart deals, the sweetheart deals. Uh, all these sweetheart deals for Exxon Mobile. Duty-free concessions upon duty-free concessions. We hear also about the uh, American Airlines in Guyana, which is a good thing. But we also hear that whatever whatever bill is going through uh, Exxon Mobil, the taxpayers have to pay for that as well. What's happening? Yeah, so, you know, people accuse me of being anti-Exxon. Well, no, I like Exxon. I come from the oil industry. I, I am very happy and excited we have oil in Guyana. And we're lucky to have Exxon. Exxon is a big, competent company, technically strong. You know, with regard to safety and health and safety, HSE, they're, they're very good. But commercially, trying to work with them, they're tough. They're very good business people, strong commercially. And the problem is Guyana is weak, weak commercially. We can't look out for ourselves. So we get, in, in effect, screwed. So, you know, that's not Exxon's fault. That is our fault. Uh, so, I we we got to be careful. It's, you know, we can't blame Exxon for this. What Exxon is doing in Guyana, even though it's, I would say, some of it is is pretty nasty. You know, with buying into Kaichor and Kanji and things like that, they do it all around the world, and the government of Guyana needs to know that and take precautions against it. But they're not. So I I kind of uh, stop. You know, discourage people from, you know, Exxon is not the big boogeyman. Um, it's just we know need to know how to deal with them. And I think that's important to note as well. Uh, we, we're not knocking Exxon as the big boogeyman. You said that they're quite competent indeed. Um, but it's the negotiations, man. That That is what's puzzling. How could we negotiate for 18 million U.S. dollars, which is basically pounds, you know? And had you not just gone around fishing or getting information, we probably would not have even known that there was a signing bonus. 18 lousy million dollars. I think it should be renegotiated, hopefully soon. In 2025, um, Liza got faced to their expected, uh, what is it, um, 750,000 barrels per day? Well... Actually, Liza One is the first project which should come on stream later this year. It'll probably be about 120,000 barrels per day. Liza Two, which will be a couple of years after, will add an additional probably 200,000 barrels today per day. So then we'll be up to about 300 and something thousand barrels per day. And then they'll have a third project which is going to add another 100 or 200,000 barrels per day. But you know. We, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have approved Liza 2. We, we should have used, you know, we got Liza 1, that's common, and the oil is common. But we should not have approved the Liza 2 project a couple months ago, or a month or two ago. We should have used that approval to squeeze Exxon, to say, no, Exxon, we're not approving this uh, Liza 2 until we get a better deal, uh, and, and use that as leverage. And that's what you have to do. That's what you do in the industry. But the government uh, did not do that. And that was very disappointing. God in heaven knows why it wasn't done, but hopefully uh, we can get some explanation uh, from those relevant authorities in yeah. Guyana. Uh, that energy agency, uh, from a rating of 1 to 10, how do you rate that particular agency? Um, the new Guyana? Department of Energy? Yes. Uh, I am I very glad that 
it was created because the president was bold to set that up. You know, we need to recognize President Granger. He's a very cautious man, but he does make bold moves. Like releasing the contract, for example. Uh, none of the ministers wanted that contract released. And then the president released it. Setting up the new Department of Energy, you know, to take oil and gas away from the Ministry of Natural Resources and to set up a new department, it was clear we needed to do that. But to do that, it was a bold move by the president. Now, it's not going as, you know, in terms of like the plan or the expectations I had, but, you know, they have their own plans and plans change. Um, and we need to see, it's still too early to judge. We need, they, they don't really have anyone there. Um, they, they need to hire handfuls of, of professionals uh, before we, we can say. I, I did see some troubling signs from them, like uh, none of these blocks should be awarded secretly. But there's one block left, block C, which is a big block up by Suriname. And some ministers were saying publicly in the papers, oh, we need to award this via secret negotiations, closed door negotiations, because we need to get Petrobras in, you know, to be a counterweight to Venezuela. And I was writing in the paper saying, no, no, in no secret deals, this has to be a public auction so that everyone can bid and we get the highest price for it. And the new Department of Energy, they were like on the fence. But I, and that worried me, but I think recently they came out and said, no, no more secret negotiations. So that's a good sign. Uh, what they did with ELISA 2, the approval of ELISA 2 was a bad sign. Surely a bad sign. Uh, we're looking at the time. Uh, Jan Mango is here with us, and uh, we'd love to have him back as often as possible to uh, talk about the oil situation in Guyana and uh, whether that deal, obviously the deal is not really a good deal for Guyana, but we have to make it work. Uh, if there are possibilities that we can renegotiate some of these uh, blind deals prior to 2015, as we discussed also about the um, the, the Kaichor and the Kanji blocks as well, uh, given out to people who are basically incompetent, who can't even get the job done. Probably can't even buy a bicycle or a sweetie. Yeah. That's so the way the, the analogy I use for that is, if you have land, you own land, and you lease this land to rice farmers, you know you don't want to farm it yourself, but you just lease out land. So you, you and you're looking to lease some land out uh, that's vacant right now to a rice farmer, and you hear that oh well they got this foreign company in town and they hired some of your neighbor's land and they're paying a hundred dollars an acre you're hearing rumors about that and then the next day this guy from down the road comes up to you and said oh partner can you uh can you lease me some of your land and you ask him how much he said i'll pay a dollar and then you you know oh well this guy you know this guy don't even know what rice looks like this guy never farmed rice and and then you know this foreigner is paying a hundred dollars an acre, and you're going to lease it to this guy who is just paying a dollar an acre. That's crazy. Why would you do that? But that's what the government did. That's what, before prior to the elections in 2015, that's what uh, Robert Passad and them did. Certainly high class robbery, and we got to get to the bottom of that. And uh, the discussion is basically. Uh, just to get to the bottom of the situation we are in Guyana and to get something even way better than what we have gotten. I'm still disappointed with that $18 million signing yeah. bonus where Brazil got close to a billion dollars. Yeah. All right, so we're Mark, looking at the time, you know, feel free. We're going to invite you. We want you back as often yeah. as possible. Is um, there, is there uh, time for just one last point, like a bigger picture point? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Now, with energy, we need to, you know, there's a bigger story going on here. If you remember, you know, speak to the academics, the historians, the exploitation of people and slavery was all around energy. People were enslaved because they didn't have machines back then. They used enslaved people for energy. And an indentureship is the same thing. 
Now we transition to machines. Machines are run by oil. So the oil is being stolen to run these machines. So it's all about energy. It's an old story of exploitation. And Guyanese need to recognize that. You know, this is not about becoming revolutionary or nationalizing stuff. No, it's just recognizing that this is an old historical story of exploitation of energy and we're being exploited and we need to step up. Dr. Finney, Dr. Mangal, uh, thank you so much for being our guest this evening. Very informative. And for those of you around the world, uh, we will definitely have, I see some folks are asking uh, for us to stay on much longer, but we just cannot do that. One hour is sufficient. Uh, quickly, 30 seconds. Uh, optimism for Guyanese doctor in the, in, in the oil industry. Some sort of optimism. Yeah, this is a huge opportunity for Guyana. But Guyanese... To make this happen, they have to do it themselves. They can't rely on the politicians. They can't rely on anyone. Guyanese have to make this happen themselves. Certainly have to make it happen ourselves. Um, for Guyanese, you guys have to make it happen. Like the doctor said, not necessarily a uh, revolution in that sense, but to speak out, make these things, make our politicians accountable as well. Uh, Dr. Mangal, thank you so much for your time this evening, sir. Good, thank you. Yeah, that was Dr. Jan Mangle.